Krishna Bolo Hey yeah, Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Hey Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna Evil Ram Ram Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna 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 The Tiger Ram 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 Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna Krishna the tiger Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Pancha <laughs> Jai Jai Prabhupan Prabhupan Jai Prabhupan Sankirtan ki jai. <clears throat> so, this is probably one of the mo more important verses in the entire Bhagavad Gita. So, it's very fundamental to understanding mm, the whole process of bhakti. Mm -hmm. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Aniyas Chintayantomam. Yejana paryupasate Te sam nitya biyuktanam Yoga shema vahamiyaham Ananyas chintayantumam Yejana paryupasate Te sam nitya biyuktanam 
योग क्षेम वहाम अहम अनया चिंतम हम ये जना पर्युभासते तेषम नित्याभियुक्तानम योग क्षेमम ब्रह्मे अहम Having no other object, chintaya, concentrating, mum, on me, ye, those, who, jana, persons, paryupasate, properly worship, te sum, of them, nitya, always. Abhiyuktanam, fixed in devotion. Yoga, requirements. Shemam, protection. Vahamiyam, carry. I, I carry. <laughs> okay, so translation. Krishna speaks, but those who always worship me with exclusive devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, for them I carry what they lack, and preserve what they have. <clears throat> Purport: One who is unlive, uh, one who is unable to live for a moment without Krishna consciousness cannot but think of Krishna twenty-four hours a day. Be engaged in devotional service by hearing, chanting, remembering, offering prayers, worshiping, serving the lotus feet of the Lord, rendering other service, cultivating friendship, and surrender fully to the Lord. Such activities are all auspicious and full of spiritual potencies, which make the devotee perfect in self-realization, so that his only desire is to achieve the association of the supreme personality of Godhead. Such a devotee undoubtedly approaches the Lord without difficulty. This is called yoga. By the mercy of the Lord, such a devotee never comes back to this material condition of life. Shema refers to the merciful protection of the Lord. The Lord helps the devotee to achieve Krishna consciousness by yoga, and when he becomes fully Krishna conscious, the Lord protects him from falling down to a miserable condition of life. <clears throat> Om Gyan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmelitam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaur Vani Pacharine 
Here we say, Sunyavadi Pasyatyade Satarine. Vanchakalpa, Thiru Vishya, Kripa Sindhu, Paeva Cha, Patitanam, Pavane Bhyo, Vaishnava Bhyo, Namahona Maha, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Sia Dvaita Gadadhar, Sivasadi Gaur, Bhakta Vindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I think this verse. <coughs> in its understanding is what we lack mostly in this Krishna consciousness movement. <laughs> the devotees are always trying to think that they need so many things and they have to make separate endeavors to get these things. But here Krishna declares straightly, I mean right to the point, if you engage in my service and you think of me, whatever you need, I give you whatever you whatever you lack. Uh, I carry <laughs> whatever you have. I preserve whatever you need. I I provide. <laughs> so that takes faith. But this is Krishna's declaration. He doesn't just say these things. Of course, it requires a devotee to have faith and engage fully in devotional service. And Prabhupada, you know, makes a list of the different angas of bhakti that's mentioned here. And so this is very important. Okay, 90%. Okay. But the temple president counts 20%, so that makes 100. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I was getting scared. I was thinking of leaving, but now... <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this this verse, as I was saying, devotees have a problem. Uh, Ananta, devotees don't really believe in this verse. They think that they have to make so many endeavors in Krishna consciousness to get what they need. And therefore they struggle unnecessarily and sometimes even go outside of Krishna consciousness to get these things. But it's not necessary. If you just stay fixed in Krishna consciousness, then Krishna will provide everything. But he wants to see how fixed you are. Whether you're just worshipping him to get what you need, or you're actually worshipping him in devotion. So one who's worshipping him in devotion, as he says here, exclusive devotion, that means he becomes the exclusive principle. Then, <clears throat> And thinking about him, thinking about his form. We don't really have to make a big effort to think about his form because we have pictures of the Lord everywhere. So we simply by seeing his that picture, we were, we were, were thinking about his form. We have deities, we have pictures, of course, we can always think of him in our mind also. So there's no problem to think about the Lord. He's everywhere. And all, the, all everything is his energy, so if you connect the principle that everything in creation, everywhere is his energy, you can see him in an indirect way through his different energies. <clears throat> There's an interesting story that Prabhupada tells in regard to this verse. It's about one a very poor young man whose name was Arjunacharya. He lived in South India. And um, he would go out every day begging and then he, whatever he would get, he would bring to his wife, she would prepare it, and that's what they had for the day. So they were quite poor. So one day he was reading Bhagavad Gita, and he came to this verse. And he was thinking, hmm, this, this verse is not right. So, I, I you know, I'm, I... I can't accept it that the Lord actually does this directly. He probably does it through his energies. But he, the word vihami aham means I carry. So Krishna says I do it. So he was thinking, this is, you know, this is, I think it's just words. But actually what it really means is that Krishna arranges things through his different energies. So he took his pen and in the book he crossed out vihami aham. 
in the verse. <laughs> and then he went out that day for begging. So while he was out begging, two young boys came, two beautiful boys, and they were carrying this bamboo pole, you know, loaded down with goods on each side. Yeah, that's it, you got it. Oh, you must have been doing it in your last life. Maybe next life. <laughs> Hopefully not. But you can do it in the spiritual world, too. It's actually... There it's... It's light, it's not so heavy. And uh, so these boys were carrying all this boga. And they knocked on the door. His wife answered, No. Wow, such beautiful young men. Mataji, your husband, he has sent us with the goods that he got today. And he told us to bring it to you. So we are bringing it. But at first we, we weren't so ill. We weren't so uh, eager to do it, so he took his cane and started beating us. Really? She's thinking, "My wow, my husband is not like that. These boys are so... Be Why would she, he beat them? But here, we, we've come, so please take all this. So she was very happy. It was more than they ever needed in one day. It was enough for a month. So then she took it inside... And then she said to the boys, you must be hungry. So they said, no, actually, we have to go. She said, no, no, I'm going to prepare you something, so please eat. So she cooked something, and she offered it to them. They ate, and then they left. And then uh, she sat down and started taking the remnants. While she was eating, her husband returned. And he was a little shocked. My wife is eating. Where did she get the food in even if she had food, why would she eat before me? Because the duty of the wife, at least Vedic wife, is they would always serve the husband first, and then they would eat. And that was, that's the culture, that was the etiquette. So he's wondering, and he starts talking to his wife, and she said, well, she said, well, why did, why did you beat those two boys? What two boys? The two boys, they came and they brought all this boga, see? And she showed him. He was astonished. I didn't give any boga to any two boys. And then, but then you beat them. Why? What are you talking about? And then finally, after thinking about it, he understood that that was Krishna Balaram. <laughs> and then he went back to the verse, and when he saw that what those lines that he crossed out were not crossed out anymore. <laughs> he had crossed them out, but when he came back to his uh, Bhagavad Gita, they weren't crossed out anymore. So he could understand the Lord. I actually wanted to so, show him, Vahamiyaham, I carry. I do it directly. It's not like I send someone personally. And this story illustrates this. was a beautiful story from South India how the Lord is very much there, eager to make sure the devotee has whatever they need to execute Krishna consciousness. Sometimes we just get into this mindset that we need things that we don't need. Well, and sometimes we, that becomes uh, our meditation. We actually think, well, I need this, I need that, I need this. And so Krishna will consider it. Sometimes he'll also give you something you don't need just to... Uh, show his reciprocation, but generally he doesn't do that. And if he does, he sees how you deal with it. And if it makes you less Krishna consciousness, then he takes it away, less Krishna conscious. So, and then he won't do it again, because he, he wants to give everything you need so you can live nicely and happily. He likes his devotee to be happy. It's not that you have to suffer now, then when you die you get the reward. <laughs> it's not like that. Krishna consciousness is not like that. Some religions are like that. Oh, there's a, there's a group of people called the Stoics. The Stoics. You've heard of them? Stoics? S-T-O-C-I... S-T-O-I-C-K... S-T-O-C... Stoic... Uh, S-T-O-I-C, S-T-O-I-C, Stoic. Jai, number 10, he made it. Whoa, give him a hand. Yeah.
Give him some maha prasadam, yeah. Wash his feet, give him a garland, yeah. <laughs> give him... <laughs> Wow, wow, we he made it. We completed completed the package. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so this group called the Stoics, they believe that life is miserable. So they live a very what we say, miserable life. <laughs> they don't really engage in any kind of singing or dancing, or any kind of merrymaking in any way. They usually, they do some worship, but their worship is very, like, solemn, and very, like, not very joyful, like kirtan or anything like that. So they're called Stoics, and there's a, you can look it up in the dictionary, they're called Stoicism. It's an actually an ism, it's a belief that people, that life is very serious and actually it's very miserable. So we should also align ourselves with that mood. <laughs> but the devotees know that uh, that the, the soul is by nature sachit ananda, and ananda is joyful. So by nature we are joyful. So Krishna likes to see his devotees happy. He does. It's not like he likes to see you miserable and when you are more miserable, he becomes more happy. It's not like that. Krishna loves this. And the devotees are not happy, then Krishna thinks, oh, maybe what I can do to inspire them in their activities in life. But Krishna is always helping the devotee on all levels. We sometimes can't see that because we're so much absorbed in what we're doing and what we need and... And we don't even see Krishna. But when you really get absorbed in devotional service, you see how Krishna is, makes everything happen so nicely. You think, oh, how did this happen? I didn't even really try so hard, and it happened. And when Krishna's pleased, things just happen automatically. It doesn't You don't even have to do anything. Krishna just arranges so things so nicely. So... He's always working for his devotee. He has a personal relationship with his devotee. For him, his devotee is everything. He says that, you know, my devotee is very dear to me. And my devotee is actually my heart. My devotees exist within my heart. And the more advanced you become, the more pure devotee you become, the more you can feel the love that the Lord is giving more and more. So the Lord is always there. We don't have to, to worry about it. Don't get in anxiety like, oh, I need this, I have to have this, or I don't get this. And if you make some small plans for whatever you need, and if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Then you go on with your devotional service. And sometimes, and this is, happens mo a lot, I should say, a lot of times, we want something or we need something, but Krishna makes you wait a little bit just to see how much you stay steady in your devotion. When you stay steady in your devotional service, sometimes you say, oh, you know, I wanted that a while back, but then I gave up the idea, but now here it is. <laughs> Do you ever have that experience? It just comes. That's Krishna. So Krishna is very much part of the devotee's life. In fact, he's a very big part of the well, he's always in. He's always there. And he's always telling us, or guiding us, on how best to live in Krishna consciousness. Sometimes we get so stuck in our own mindset that we can't see it. But when we pray to Krishna, and especially when you chant his holy name, like sometimes, have you ever had the experience you feel tired, and you start chanting, and then when you're chanting, all of a sudden you feel energy again? Because you're actually nourishing the energy part of your body. The body, the, the soul is the source of energy. Food gives you nourishment, which keeps your body functioning. But the energy you need is coming from the soul. So sometimes you see, uh, devotees can exhibit tremendous energy. 
Why? Because when their soul is, when they're connected to Krishna in devotion, that energy becomes so powerful. Because it's Krishna's energy when the soul is actually connected like that. So uh, we have this one story where uh, it was an amazing story. And the devotees were doing a deity installation in one place. I think, I'm not sure where, somewhere in Europe. Might have been London or might have been in uh, Holland, Amsterdam. And uh, they, were, they had put together an altar. They had these big, heavy columns. And then they had made the altar. And then they put this big, gigantic piece of wood on the top, which was the cover for the columns. And it was heavy. I mean, it took two strong men to bring that column in, and, and it took many to lift it up to get it there. So uh, Prabhupada was sitting in the front, and he was getting ready for the ceremony, but the altar started to shake. And that top piece started to fall, and it was going to fall on the deities. And so Prabhupada saw it, and he got up and he ran, and his hand, and he grabbed that big piece of well, that was falling down, and he held it by himself until devotees came and, and helped him. But everybody thought, how was it possible that Prabhupada could hold that huge? It was big, and it was really heavy. It took two men just to carry it. It took four men to put it up. And Prabhupada was just holding it. Like, and of course, Prabhupada was, it was, he was struggling to hold it. But he did it. <laughs> Here's this elderly gentleman, a small little Indian man. He, Prabhupada was short. He was about, he was about the size of uh, Ananta. He was really small. <laughs> but small is big in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> so Prabhupada was small, but when he would, his presence was very, what we say, uh, commanding. He would be the center of everything. So Prabhupada just held that up like then. And devotees were talking about that after. How did Prabhupada do that? <laughs> but then they understood, you know, here's the, here's the example of spiritual strength manifesting itself in physical strength, you know. So that was a nice, you know. So the devotees are always in the best position like that. So we don't have to worry about anything. All we have to do is think about how best we can serve and engage in devotional service like that. And this is what makes the devotee happy. Um, so this verse is, is fundamental. It's one of the more important verses in here. And Prabhupada says, The Lord helps the devotee to achieve Krishna consciousness by yoga. And when he becomes fully Krishna consciousness, the Lord protects him from falling down to a miserable condition of life. So you might say, well, how sometimes we see advanced devotees who have been practicing for many years and have shown their uh, expertise in devotional activities, stayed fixed, and after some time they fall down. <clears throat> what, what is that? Well, because it's, it's understood that there's two ways that that happens. One is that there is some material attachment that this advanced devotee has, hasn't given up and doesn't want to give it up. And Krishna is trying to teach and show that devotee what that is and trying to relieve him of that, but the devotee continues to hang on to it. So after some time, that material attachment becomes strong and the devotee again starts taking up material things. Because in devotional service you have to go all the way. You can't go halfway. Halfway means you take another birth and you begin where you left off. So when you're practicing in this life, the higher you go, the higher you have to go. Because if you stop, you go backwards. You can't say, well, I made it to a certain level of bhakti, and that's good, I'm going to stay there. No. Because uh, the material energy is like a river flowing in a certain direction. So a river can flow upwards, upstream or downstream, it can go either way. So it's so mostly downstream. 
So practicing Krishna consciousness means to swim against the current. That means there is some effort to go against the current. Because the current of this world is birth, death, disease, old age, miseries of the body, miseries of the mind, miseries of other living entities, miseries of higher powers, uh, so many opportunities to deviate by different forms of sense gratification. So it's a struggle. The devotees have to struggle. But as soon as you stop swimming, you have enough power to swim against the current by the mercy of the Lord. But as soon as you stop swimming, then the river is going to carry you back down in the opposite direction. So this is very instructive to understand that uh, we should never be satisfied with whatever level of Krishna consciousness we have achieved. We always want to go higher and go to a, the level of perfection like that. And that way we will always be in the best position because then Krishna will help you and show you how to make advancement more and more. And as you make advancement, if you remain, if you stop, follow the process properly, Krishna protects you from falling down. As Prabhupada says here, like that. So the other way you can fall down is offenses to Vaishnavas. So if you commit offenses to devotees, your, your taste in Krishna consciousness gets checked. You don't fall down immediately, but you lose the taste. Or the taste becomes less. And you wonder why you're not so happy or enthusiastic in devotional service. But then, if you don't correct those faults and don't do some retribution for that offense, then you could also also completely fall down in Krishna consciousness. So one has to, uh, you know, ameliorate or make right the offenses, and then one can again start developing the taste again. The taste comes when one chants Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So that's, here's where our taste comes, and then of course Krishna Prasadam, that's also tasty. And then the activities of devotional service as we become more and more into Devotees work hard, I understand. <laughs> okay. The trick is to fall asleep without letting anybody know it. See, that's the... Okay, yeah, that's an art that some devotees have perfected. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, if anybody falls asleep in my class, then it just shows that this is the... This is what you should do, because... To stay awake, it has to be interesting. <laughs> Prabhupada would say, sleep 13 hours a day, but stay awake in class. <laughs> but I'm not, he's not telling you to sleep 13 hours a day. He's just making a, a sweeping statement. <laughs> in other words, stay awake in class, he meant to say, it's so important that if you can't, then you know you better get some enough rest so when you come to class you stay awake like that okay and when we were in New Vrindavan devotees would fall asleep all the time in fact the whole class would fall asleep sometimes even the speaker <laughs> really I'm serious it's not like I'm just saying that there was one very uh, monumental g class where one devotee was, he was up there. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharma Parikshit Mamai Kum. Saranam Vajam. <laughs> Aham. Didn't miss a word. <laughs> came back. Everybody was waiting. Hmm. I, I guess he's meditating on the next word. I don't know. <laughs> but it wasn't like that. <laughs> it was yoga. It was, it was nidra, you know. 
So yeah, devotees work so hard in Nubrandava that when we would sit, you couldn't sit down if you were a devotee in Nubrandava, because as soon as you sat down, you fell asleep. <laughs> Just the way it was. Nobody had any problem sleeping at night. In fact, as you got into bed and your head was going down towards the pillar, when it hit the pillar, you were already out. <laughs> there was no in-between. But then again, devotees had problems staying awake in class, so we used to make the different programs for keeping devotees awake. We had the squirt gun problem, where the speaker would have a big bottle of water with a big giant nozzle on it, and the thing would shoot far. And this would keep the devotees, you know, you get a little abhi shake during the class. <laughs> But that didn't always work, because it usually got the floor all wet. So, uh, so we tried other things. There was one devotee who'd always fall asleep in class. So we used to say, if you fall, if you're tired, just stand up. But then he would fall down while he was standing up and crashed. It. But it was good because when he hit the floor, everybody else would wake up. <laughs> so yeah, Nurandavan was king for that. And the, you know, the devotees used to, I mean, really work hard. It was a farm, and the devotees would really work hard. And we would get up really early, sometimes two, two thirty, three. If you got up any later than three, you were, you were really in Maya. <laughs> really. Mongolarti was at 4.30. So, yeah. So devotees have to uh, understand that every anything you need, Krishna will provide. Just stay fixed in your service. And be a little patient. And Lord said, as, as Rupa Goswami says, Utsahan nishtaya daryat. Daryat means patient. We have to be patient, and Krishna will provide everything you need in Krishna consciousness automatically. And whatever you have, what he says when he doesn't mean material things, he's talking about whatever you need spiritually, whatever you have spiritually. I preserve that and I provide that. Material things also fall into this category in the sense that if something is necessary for one's execution of devotion, just like I, I just look around my kitchen sometimes and I say, and I say, hmm, well, Mother Somadachi will be coming soon and I'll get whatever I need. <laughs> <laughs> and she provides so fast and whatever she provides is like, expert. It's just like Krishna is perfect working through her. I get everything I need in the best quality. It's not just, you know, I asked for a ladle for scooping up, you know, prashadam. She brought a really nice fancy ladle, perfect size. Everything is perfect, she does. It's just like, it's too good. So, so, so Prabhupada well, not Prabhupada. Krishna mentions that there are 20, 26 qualities of the devotee. And the, I think number 25 is, is expert. The devotee is expert in whatever they do. This is one of the characteristics of a devotee. It's not like, well, I did something, you don't like it. I still did it, so you got to accept it. <laughs> no. You should do it in the nicest possible way because that is, that is the principle that allows for bhakti to develop, that I want to serve the Lord, and I want to serve the devotees, but not just serve, I want to serve in the way that is the best possible way. And that keeps one, what we say, enthusiastic in devotional service. Enthusiasm can manifest itself even in the smallest and insignificant activity when you think how to do it nicely. It's like uh, Bhaktivad Sal came to my apartment today and we were hanging pictures up. So he's very good at doing that, but I'm also very precise in how the picture should be on the wall. So if it's one half centimeter 
off, we have to re we have to make it the adjustment. So he's enthusiastic to make that one half centimeter disappear, <laughs> and I'm very enthusiastic to make sure he makes it disappear. <laughs> so, so yeah, so he he's expert at doing all these uh, what we say handyman jobs. He does it so first class. So I don't have any problem when I call him. Tomorrow I'll call him to ask him to do the same thing, and tomorrow he'll mess it up because now he thinks he's good. <laughs> it's like that one story. Uh, where, oh, I can't remember. Let me see the details, think of the details. Anyway, it was, well, one very senior devotee that, uh, oh, yeah, it was Bhakti Tirta Swami Maharaj. And after he had been preaching in, uh, communist countries, I mean black body devotee behind the Iron Curtain during during the height of communism. He was preaching, he probably even preached in this area too. He used to come to communist countries and preach Krishna consciousness undercover. And Prabhupada said, anyone who preaches Krishna consciousness an undercover or who preaches in Muslim countries, I take the dust of their feet on my head. That's a powerful statement Prabhupada made. So when Prabhupada came to London towards the end of his uh, visit on earth, uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami brought Bhakti Tirta Swami to see Srila Prabhupada. And as soon as Bhakti Tirta Swami came, his name was Ganesham at the time, Prabhupada got up from his desk, walked over to Bhakti Tirta Swami and embraced him and said, your life is perfect. Wow. <laughs> I don't think, Prabhupada just maybe embraced two or three of his devotees in the, in, in the entire time he was here. He wasn't like something he would do. But he gave a very, what we say, welcoming and happy embrace to Bhakti Tirta Swami and said, your life is perfect, that's what he said. So he got so much mercy from Prabhupada. So the next day, Prabhupada was in his room, Bhakti Tirta Swami came in and he just quietly sat in the back. So Prabhupada could understand he became a little proud. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, always remember Krishna is the doer. And that's all he said. <laughs> Krishna is the doer. So yeah, so we get praised, we get honored, but we have to understand that it's Krishna behind everything and he makes everything happen. And if we try hard, then we see things work out really nice. You have to try in Krishna consciousness. It's not like you sit back, Prabhupada said, it's not like it. everything's so nice, let me sleep all day and Krishna's consciousness is already here, I'm, I'm fixed. <laughs> no, Prabhupada said you have to work for it. And that inspires greater and greater intelligence, greater creativity. Uh, just like when Prabhupada was preaching in America, he could understand the Americans, they like to do big things. He said, because you're an American, you like to be big, do big things. <laughs> And that's true. So Prabhupada gave uh, the, the devotees in America a lot of big projects. Why? Because he knew that if he didn't, they would become somewhat lazy. So in order to keep the devotees inspired in the Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada gave so many challenges. Go here, do this, preach this, offer, open this project over here. And sometimes he would give more, and the devotees would say, well, Prabhupada, yeah, okay, but which one should we stop in order to... Prabhupada, what, what do you mean stop? No, you just add this one on. 
So Prabhupada would always be pushing. He would sometimes he would push really hard, and sometimes the devotees would think, "Whoa, <laughs> you know." But because Prabhupada was also pushing himself, you know, he would sleep a couple hours a day translating the Bhagavatam and meeting people, and preaching, giving classes, meeting, uh, taking so much time. He hardly slept, he hardly ate, and he was traveling all around the world. No one could keep up. So Prabhupada was actually doing more than the devotees were doing, but at the same time he was pushing the devotees to do more and more. And some devotees really loved that. They liked the challenges. And others felt that it was too much. You know. But Prabhupada knew that if you don't push somebody, they get lazy. So it's, Prabhupada said, that's the job of the, the, the temple authorities, to always inspire the devotees in more and more projects to keep them enlivened in Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, they have a tendency to, to, get, to waste time or get a little lazy. Yeah. So that's how Prabhupada spread this movement by inspiring devotees to do more and giving more and more opportunities to spread Krishna consciousness sending devotees around the world to open up centers, to distribute books, to, uh, to purchase temples, so many things. And Prabhupada gave some pretty hard... I mean, he told Tamal Krishna Goswami, get that land in Mayapur. And it was difficult, really difficult. He, re he worked for months and months trying to negotiate that land in Mayapur and it was really difficult. Finally, when he finally got that land, he uh, came to see Prabhupada at one o'clock in the morning because that's when he had completed the deal with the land. It finished at one in the morning. He came to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada was so happy to see him. Prabhupada didn't care, it was one in the morning. He just wanted to hear that now we have that land. Prabhupada was so happy. He was so happy. And so, yeah, that was a, a great struggle. The devote, and Then another great struggle was when the de devotees had printed Krishna book, and it had to be shipped into Bombay on boats, and the shipment wasn't coming. And Prabhupada was waiting for months. When is the shipment? And he sent Brahmananda, no, Tamal Krishna also, to go down to talk to the men who were running the shipping lines. Why isn't the books coming? And then when the books come, they wouldn't release the books. They wouldn't give it to the devotees. There were some, some reasons. They were holding back for some reason. And the devotees couldn't fulfill the reasons. So Tamal Krishna go and other devotees went and couldn't do anything. Finally Tamal Krishna Goswami came. And by his power, determination, and he uh, got the book got the books released and then Prabhupada was so happy. So spreading Krishna consciousness in those days wasn't easy. <laughs> and we were a new movement and people were really didn't even know what we were, and many people did, didn't like us either. So that was the way it was. Now it's a little easier because we have temples, we have more money, we have more devotees, we have more facilities, like that. But still, it's not that we stop, and we have to continue to see how we can expand our Krishna consciousness in quality and in quantity. <laughs> Like that. Okay. Questions? Any comments? Questions? Jai Shishi Panchatattva Ki Jai. We got one in the back there. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for amazing lecture. One of the best I ever heard. It's really amazing. I think I will hear it again and again. Uh, so, like if a devotee or someone come into the situation and for one, for one reason you want to stay close to the temple, but expenses like here in Ljubljana are pretty much right. high. So, if you if you need to work too much to be somewhere, that also hmm. it might. So you want to live closer, but it's more expensive, and in order to get the money, you have to work. Yeah, and then you don't have, and and for some reason, then you don't have so much time to. Yeah to the world for sadhana, for them. I have a, an answer for it. Maybe you won't like my answer. You got any more beds in the ashram? <laughs> any more room for Brahmish? Yes. For, yeah. yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you would be great here. You could really enliven the devotees. No location, you don't even have to travel. <laughs> Money, what's that? <laughs> so, yeah, are you married? Yeah, then what's the use? Of staying outside. <laughs> If you're married, I can understand, and there's a, there's a very valid reason. Think about it. <laughs> yeah, but generally, like, uh, generally, like, if you're in similar situation, like, you said that everything uh, which should come, comes by Krishna's grace, like, the more you're conscious, the more automatically it comes, so and then if you persist, persist, you, you're patient and things are not coming, then obviously Krishna has other plan. Yeah, I just told you his plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously when something doesn't work and it's not, and you've tried for so long, you can see there's, you, is you're just going in the wrong direction, that's all. Just like, you know, I like to travel, but right now I can't. So Krishna's made sure that I don't travel. He's made me COVID positive. <laughs> Even though I'm not. <laughs> so this will make sure that I don't travel. <laughs> so he tricked me. Yeah. So when it's time to travel, I'll become negative. <laughs> but right now, he won't let me travel. And he knows I don't want to travel, but at the same time, I do. <laughs> so he, he knows what's best for me, even though I can't see it all the time. Yeah. And I just think about going to London and, you know, getting all that nice Indian cooking. <laughs> no, I'm not just kidding. <laughs> so yeah, I just miss a lot of the devotees in different places around the world. So, but still, he wants me here and I'm surrendered. <laughs> but it didn't take me, you know, I, have, I had to finally come to that understanding that Krishna doesn't want me to travel. It's obvious. But it wasn't so obvious when I first got here. Yeah. So if you see me trying to buy a ticket or getting a cab in the middle of the night, <laughs> just make sure, you know, you call the police. <laughs> He's breaking police hours. So yeah, we, we sometimes we just have to realize that Krishna knows what's best for us. And when it becomes obvious by our efforts, we can see, oh, 
this is not what is best for me. Krishna can show it. So you can make an experiment, come into the ashram for a while and see how it goes. There's no loss, you can always leave after five years, you know. <laughs> or two years. I always say to everyone who is not married, to join the ashram for minimum two, two years and get training. And then if there's some reason why you need to leave, then you can go and see if that's the best thing for you. But two-year training, I think, is, is should be required for everyone who comes to Krishna consciousness. Minimum, minimum two years. I told that to one of my disciples. He didn't want to do it. And when he did, after two years, he stayed longer. Hmm? He stayed longer. He, after two years, he liked it so much that he decided to stay longer. But in, initially, he didn't want to go at all. He wanted to stay outside. And actually, what your, your spiritual life will take off, and I'll tell you why. Because there's four ashrams. There's Brahmachari, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, and Sanyas. Living outside and not being married is no ashram. It's not an ashram. It's called bachelor daddy. <laughs> that means you're a bachelor, but you're a daddy at the same time. You're associating too closely with the material. A wife gives protection against all that when you're in, in Grihastha life. She protects you against all the outside influences. But without the wife, then you, you know, you're vulnerable to all these the sense objects that are everywhere. And then, therefore, living in the ashram is actually brahmachari. And living outside with a wife is Grihastha. But there's no in-between ashrams. Kali Yuga, we have created this in-between ashram that so many people live outside but are not really. And as soon as you get into your ashram, you'll see your Krishna consciousness took off. Just just happened to one devotee just last week. After so many years of not being married, he got married. And now, now he told me he's just, he's much more happier ever. Now he's living an honest Grihastha life, you know. Mm -hmm. So... Like that, but we like our freedom, so we just, we think by having by living outside, and I can make my own plans. But the idea is to work and make the ashram better, so each devotee has everything they need, like that. I would suggest, of course, this the temple president will not let me give class after I make this suggestion. <laughs> that devotees have individual rooms in the ashram mm -hmm. where they can have minimum two no maximum no no brahmachari should live alone every there should be rooms where two devotees in every room everyone can pair up with someone that they can get along with really good and then you can have many rooms with two devotees that's how they do it in hungary the devotees are in pairs in, in different rooms like that so that's that's ashram life. To put everyone in the big dormitory style, where you know, it's it's it can be a little difficult, especially as you get older, to be in that environment. So if you can make rooms here, set more rooms aside, and put two devotees, maybe sometimes you can even put three in one room, like that. And devotees will be happier, they have more space, they can do, they can have more freedom to, to move around and do things. Um, a lot of times we're in an ashram with there so many devotees and there's certain devotees we just kind of like there's some friction there. <laughs> Sometimes. It's just, it's a personality conflict, that's all it is. There's certain personalities that just don't go together. It's just the way it is. It's just personality. It's not that devotees are just don't like each other. It's just there's a different personality, and some personalities clash automatically. 
So you can pair off in rooms, and that way you can associate with devotees that you can get along with, like that. And it's nice, like that. In uh, Budapest, the devotees have this nice building, which was this Samsung building, that, that phone company. They purchased it, and it has so many rooms. And they, each of the devotees are in rooms with two devotees each. And there's many, many rooms like that. So. That's good. So I'm just giving some practical advice. I'm not trying to manage the temple. You can throw out everything I said <laughs> if you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like that. Mataji and her. All ladies have, they have one big room? Each one has their own room. That's good, especially when they get old, you know. Older, I'm not, you're not old, you're just older. <laughs> you need some space, you know. But brahmachari shouldn't live alone. There should be at least another one, one brahmachari there, like that. Okay, so these are some practical things. All right, thank you very much. And uh, so we'll see you on Tuesday. We'll begin a seminar on, on how you should walk your dog a certain times of the day and not all day. Okay. This is, this is part of the, the environment in Ljubljana. Because people walk their dog and even in midnight here, I, I they used to, now they can't do it only up to nine o'clock. So. <laughs> I see people out there freezing. The dog's having fun, but they're freezing. You know? <laughs> well, anyway, when I go out back, when I go back and forth to the, from the temple, like around this time, eight o'clock, people are out walking their dog. Yeah, I, every night I see somebody's out there with Fido there on the leash. <laughs> so that's a good seminar. And it's actually quite an extensive seminar, so bring some bring a notepad, you can take notes. Because <laughs> we'll talk about each kind of dog and how to walk him. <laughs> I had a I had a good friend who was working with me in one project. And that was his service. He would go to rich people's houses and they would give him their dog and he would have to walk the dog. And he'd get paid for that. <laughs> so I told him, your, 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 your job is just like, it's, go, it's going to the dogs, you know. <laughs> anyway, I was just joking on that part. <laughs> So don't take me serious. So we'll start a uh, thing on Tuesday with Seminar on the Mind. I think it was requested by uh, Odontaji. Did you make that request? You did. Which devotee? Well, it has to be approved by the temple authorities, I can't just go ahead and do a lecture like that. I don't know. Did you know about it? Is that right? If you don't want it, I won't do it. Okay. Only if you say so. It's a sim. We someone we brought that subject up last night. It's, so I'll do it from Tuesday to Friday, four days. We'll cover the, f the topic of the mind, four days. Bring your mind along for the class. Don't <laughs> and, and your intelligence also. Don't leave him behind. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai.